Roberto, are you there? Hello, yes, everyone. I, yes, yes, I am. That's great. Just checking in to see if Roberto and everybody's on screen here in our webinar. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to our connection room. And as you notice, we are doing a webinar version today. Last week, we did a Zoom call and we had a little bit of interference. So we decided that uh, to minimize that happening, we will go to a webinar function this week. So please know that you can go into the Q&A and please place your questions there. Put a Q ahead of your question and we will bring it into the conversation as we're talking. And if you would really like to come on screen, please let us know and we will facilitate that for you probably closer to the end of our talk, but please let us know when you'd like to do that. I'm Jennifer Hibbard from the World Council of Health, and I'm here to introduce uh, Rubito. He will be doing our, be our host today for our webinar. And the topic of his discussion is what is mass formation and what can we do about it? And Rubito, would you please introduce yourself? Because I think he, you are doing so many fascinating, really wonderful things, such as your, uh, your COVID positive news channel that you've got on uh, Telegram and a number of other things that you're involved in. So please share what you're doing these days and because uh, everybody would like to know and certainly tune into what's happening in your life. Thank you. All right, thank you. So, well, I am a tutor of critical thinking or it's they call it at the university criticality at a university in the UK. Um, I do that. I work there and help international students to um, learn how to evaluate different information before they start studying at the university. Um, I do that every summer before they start their main course. And the rest of the year, I am a, a trained uh, hypnotherapist so I offer hypnotherapy sessions and also founder uh, of COVID positive news on telegram so yeah so that's that's uh, where I am at the moment things are evolving and developing and we've also got a uh, mentor network as well on uh, CPN COVID positive news where we offer live sessions I describe it as we're the the system that we're in right now is an um, is an uh, I use the analogy of an abusive relationship. So I say that the system, if we if we use the analogy of an abusive relationship, is not helping us, it's not serving us. And then what do we do in an abusive relationship? Well, we need to walk away, heal our wounds, and then create a different reality for ourselves. So that's what we're that's what we're doing. So I can start, or are we waiting a little bit for a few more people to to join well uh, unless you want to discuss anything more about what you what your background is and covid positive news what it is uh, i think we could probably gently go into start talking about the topic sure i i have a tendency to ramble so if i start telling you about how covid positive news started it will probably probably take over this time so let's let's just go straight into the um the uh, the presentation um jennifer could you just clarify is this roughly about one hour yes it is yeah okay and loosely in one hour i mean it's not going to get cut off right on the hour so let me just now try and share my screen I have... okay. and just let me know if you can see the presentation your screen sharing, I, I, yep, we're there. Okay. You might want to do it just on uh, the screen because it's showing your other slides. But if if that's tricky, it's okay. Can you see? Oh, you're there. Perfect. Excellent. All you right, did it. Good. All right. So, um, but now I can only see the video and I can see my slides. So I, I can't read the chat or anything at the moment. So as we move forward, I might need someone to help me out there. Okay, so I'll help you with that. I'll help you with that. I'll watch it. Great. I'll watch it. Okay. All right. So hello, everybody. And thank you for joining this. What is mass formation? And what can we do about it? Um, event, presentation and session. Um, so I love this picture. Um, I don't know exactly where it can. Can everyone see the, the sheep? Yeah. I don't know exactly uh, where it came from. It does say on the left, AFRI Forum, and uh, the name is on there. 
So um, we probably all felt a little bit like this. Hi guys, we're over here. But um, we could say that's mass formation, event finished, let's uh, discuss. But what I'm presenting here, first, uh, Dr. Matthias Desmet, and this here is a uh, very successful podcast with the pandem uh, pandemic podcast with um, uh, Dan Aston Gregory, who was at the Better Way conference. And this particular interview was specifically more was more focused on what is mass formation. And the title of this video is why do so many still buy into the narrative? I'm also using information from Dr. Matthias Desmet from a second interview, a more recent one. Ah, so I'll just say the last one was September 21st, 2021. And this one is a more recent one, May 30th, 2022. And this is uh, James Corbett, the Corbett Report. And so this, this interview is called Breaking Free from Mass Formation. And this one was more to do with what can we do about it? I should also mention that mass formation gained uh, um, popularity again when uh, Dr. Robert Malone, who was also at the Better Way Conference, uh, was with on the Joe Rogan show, and he was talking about mass formation psychosis. Dr. Matthias Desmond doesn't like the word psychosis because he says it's not a psych it's not a psychosis. But if you've heard of mass psychosis, mass formation, or mass formation psychosis, talk we're talking about the same phenomena. So it's the phenomena that we're interested in. I'm also going to bring in some views and opinions from Charles Eisenstein, who was at the General Assembly on May 30th, because he also talked about this topic as well, although he didn't talk about mass formation. He was talking about mob morality and mob mentality, but it was um, still offering solutions to this, um, this kind of phenomena. So also Charles Eisenstein. And finally, somebody else is this guy here, Dr. Robert Lanza. I also want to just mention what he says. In 2014, he was um, voted one of the 100 um, most influential people in the world. He's a stem cell and regenerative medicine expert. He's famous for the theory of biocentrism, which argues that consciousness is the driving force for the existence of the universe. And the reason that I want to bring him in is because of a recent study. And this study is from May 2021, which is an extremely complicated study because it's to do with quantum physics and quantum mechanics. But there's an article from Big Think. And uh, this article actually interviewed him where he explained what this study is about. And he explained and, and he explained what the study shows. It's fascinating. A fascinating study, a new study claims networks of observers are responsible for determining physical reality. So I'm going to, um, and maybe after the presentation, I could share the links. I'm happy to do that. Um, I've got my browser closed at the moment because my computer is struggling today. So I don't want to risk anything, but I can certainly share all these links. And this article is from June 7th, 2021. So what is mass formation? First, I'm sure many of you know what mass formation is. It's been it's gone viral. It's uh, particularly um, gone viral during the COVID um, last two and a half years. And Dr. Mateus Desmet has become a voice about this topic, particularly linked to coronavirus and the pandemic the last two years. But in the recent interview with the Corbett Report, he also was referring to more recent events like monkeypox in Ukraine and things like this. So first of all, mass formation. So I need to talk first of all about hypnosis. So hypnosis is a state of deep focus on one particular external object. And for, I can give the example of the masses focused on the Super Bowl commercials, because we know that when the Super Bowl commercials are on, that the advertisers are willing to pay millions for a few minutes. The reason is because everybody is focused on that event. And when we focus on one particular external object, then our brainwave, our brainwaves change and we move from with all our brainwaves. Uh, so we've got beta, alpha, theta, delta, they're all active, but the beta is more thinking 
alpha is more focus, theta is between dream and awake, which is a, a hypnagogic state, and then delta is sleep. And the more focused we are, the more we go down deeper in those brainwave states and the more we become connected to our subconscious. So hypnosis also focuses our attention on one particular object so that this is all we notice. When you're deep in hypnosis, you're not aware of anything else. You're very focused on this one particular thing. If it was a hypnotherapy session, it would be somebody's voice. But um, in mass formation, that hypnosis is, or that focus is on something else. So I'm sorry, this is the only slide where the text is very small, but what is mass formation? So Desmet, the first one, using this technique to take control total control of the masses. And this is used um, specifically for people uh, in history. This is used in, uh, in a, a totalitarian situation. So this is for totalitarianism. And Dr. Mateus Desma identifies four conditions for this. And I'd really like you to just consider these conditions and how they're linked to the last two and a half years. So the first one is that the masses feel alone and isolated. So there's a lack of social bond. People are isolated and feeling alone. There's a lack of social connection. The second one is that our lives feel meaningless. And that meaninglessness is often due to, or can be linked to the first one. So it can be linked to that feeling alone and it can be linked to that isolation. The third condition is a is feeling a free floating anxiety. So it's an ongoing anxiety that is just continuing. And there's no mental representation. And what Dr. Mateus Desmond means there is that that anxiety is not because of, for example, a lion that's trying to chase us and catch us and eat us. We can't identify the external reason for that anxiety. But that anxiety is an ongoing feeling and it's an ongoing thing. And in the interviews, he discusses the fact um, with, uh, in, uh, with uh, Dan in the um, pandemic podcast, particularly, he discusses how we're, we're, we're all living with these ongoing anxieties, things like needing to um, um, pay the bills, um, uh, I'm trying to think right now off the top of my head, but you know, like all those different ongoing stresses that are going on in our lives that are just um, giving us that feeling of anxiety, that ongoing feeling of anxiety. And then the fourth condition is feeling a free floating frustration and aggression. So feeling frustrated and angry with the situation. And so we're going to link this to an external event. But again, it's free floating. It's a free floating frustration and aggression that we're that people are generally feeling because of all the stresses and all the strains of life, all the pressures of life um, that uh, that we cannot identify as one particular cause. Again, just giving the example of a lion or a tiger or something chasing us and trying to kill us. Okay, so then what happens is when those conditions are met is then the authority or the authorities provide an object to focus on and they provide the solution to that external threat when they provide the object to focus on and the solution to that external threat then they relieve points three and four meaning then your anxiety is reduced and your frustration and aggression is also reduced um, by, pre by presenting that solution. So you're able to redirect that feeling of anxiety and that feeling of frustration and aggression to a particular object. And then by following the solution provided, then that anxiety, that frustration and that aggression is reduced. And also providing a solution to this external threat, which gives us meaning and gives us social bond gives us uh, stops us feeling so isolated and alone so again providing something to uh to relieve points one and two as well when that's uh when that's done then 
people are willing to well actually before we go into that so in order to in order for this to happen we need a mental representation a mental representation means we need an external threat and so obviously we've got ideas and we know what those external threats are um, so i just wanted to ask if people could put into perhaps the q a i think we're using the q a and not the chat just what are present and past mental representations that you can think of that have been used to redirect that ongoing free floating anxiety, frustration and anger to a particular external object so that those in, or in authority can then uh, provide the solution. And just wondered if anybody can give some examples and then afterwards, I'll just share the ones that I just came up with for this presentation. So it doesn't just have to be for the last two years. It can also be things from this last two years, but also maybe before then as well, because this is a technique which has been used throughout history. Can I just ask a question? Uh, sure. Can can people just put a note in the in the chat? Are you do you have access to the Q and A? I've just seen. I can actually yes, see can. it now. Yes, I just okay. saw something come through. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Good. So Stephanie uh, says that um, COVID could be the external threat. And uh, Stephanie, a vaccine, I would argue that there's the vaccine would, ah, yes, I see, COVID vaccine. So yes, COVID is the threat, vaccine is the solution. Good. Any more ideas? Maybe put them in the Q&A, because otherwise I have to check the Q&A and the chat. Don't worry, I'm watching the chat. Uh, Anna Marie has Anna Maria has said an unknown virus killing many people, uh, and um, and also Maria Munton said fear of catching COVID, who to blame the unvaccinated. So yeah. you know, so, they're all very significant. Yeah. So COVID, COVID virus, um, a virus. Um, so obviously now we've got a new virus, the monkeypox. And in the past, there were other viruses like HIV that have been used to, um, to influence the behavior of the masses. Any other ideas apart from virus? Somebody's it put terror. So Good, yeah, terrorism. So terrorism, if you remember when terrorism was there, because now that's gone, apparently, and we've got viruses instead. But when, when terrorism was the main threat, then, uh, then it was everywhere and uh, you, you were in danger constantly. And that one solution to that was that that really affected flying. If you remember all the different extra conditions and things that were put into the airports then, and it's been done again with the virus now. Uh, We've got an interesting one here. To be honest, it feels so pervasive that I'm having a hard time setting on one example. Uh, climate change, that's a good one. So climate change, any others? Or I'll just We've also on. got cost of living crisis and Ukraine-Russia war and, the night, and watching the news. Good. So external threats, um, Ukra uh, Ukraine crisis, Russia... Um, is an external threat. And again, so the, the authorities can come in with solutions and those solutions, um, if people are full of anxiety and anger and frustration, would be willing to follow those solutions in order to relieve that pressure. 9-11. Uh, more, you got, oh yeah, there you've got that 9-11 and it also carries through because these are all fears and, and are we connecting the dots? Are these indirectly related? Is, you know, is all of this happening? Is this a series that's been building up to what we're going through now? These are all questions I know that's going through all of your minds. And then Stephanie's, can you see Stephanie Alvarez's comment there? Yeah, the pervasiveness proves how they're trying to get us off kilter. So we don't know who, what to trust anymore. So we give up and blindly follow their solutions uh, that they present. Absolutely, it's a, it's a confusion tactic. Yeah, it's, um, it's using the fact that people are um, feeling this 
anxiety ongoing in a very kind of soft way, continually there. And we uh, are not sure how to deal with it. And they can then prevent, uh, provide the solution. And it's just easier for us to accept their solution than for us to go into detailed work into where that anxiety originally comes from. Which I'll As talk I about. Just I'm just typing a response to Laura who said, you know, great Zoom, grateful to be here. And I just typed, you know what? We're so grateful all of you are here because we are the solution working together and also bringing forward, you know, your frustrations, your fears uh, and, and everything. It's just on so on topic with Robito. So please carry on Robito. Thank you, everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, that's going to be part of my conclusion. <laughs> but why not? Yes, you are the heroes. You are the ones. We are. We are. We all are. OK, so I'm going to just put. So these were just a few that I came up with. Let me just see if I can. move. Yes. So in the past, it was especially in the USA, Soviet Union. And we know that um, at the time, the threat of the Soviet Union was highly exaggerated. Um, terrorism was another one that I thought of, um, a killer virus, and we've, we've had COVID, um, and now monkeypox. And I also find quite interesting that now we've got Russia as an external threat, and we had Soviet Union before. So possibly these are things that have been thought about, people have realized that they work, and they do them again. But anyway, just interesting that um, Soviet Union was such a massive one, and now we've got Russia. Okay, so the other thing is, is that in a mass formation scenario, we have to have this feeling that we're in this together. And Dr. Matthias Desmond talks about rituals and symbols. So relatively easy question, but also perhaps you guys can come up with things that are not the obvious ones. Um, I've only written down the obvious ones, so you might have some more. But in the uh, Q&A again, what are the different types of rituals um, that we've been asked to do over the last two and a half years, two years, um, that are there to, to give us that sensation and that feeling that we're in this together? Exactly, Maria, yes. Yeah. So mask wearing. Yeah, clapping for the NHS. So if you're in the UK, it was, I think, a daily thing where there was a certain time every day where everybody would go outside and stand outside your house and clap for the National Health Service for the doctors. And it was very much a community thing. People would go out, they'd take out cakes and biscuits and tea. Um, now, though, it's going so fast that I can't, I can't scroll up. It was, there's an interesting one here too, and it says always three points rituals, save granny. And the interesting thing is it's always, uh, through all our generations, it's always been protect your children, right? And now it's putting the children forward as the, as the front line to save granny. And it makes you wonder the whole objective behind all of this when it's not the adults protecting the children, but putting the children out there and putting them in, in the way of this experimental process that we're all being put through. Uh, it does make you question the whole reason behind all of this. So thank you very much for that point too. And, and, I, and I said right from the beginning, like, cause we had um, uh, um, the, the financial crisis of 2007, 2008 and people lost their homes and all of this type of stuff and nobody cared and it was uh, let's bail out the bankers and and then suddenly with covid um the governments were, were were willing to let the economy collapse to help the people so when in history ever has a government been willing to let the economy collapse because they care about the people so that already was a red flag for me it's not about the people but that's how i felt about it so Oh, absolutely. Uh, and also with the, with all the big stores, the big, uh, the big companies are all protected and all the small businessmen, all the small businesses went out of business. It was just so dystopic for what we're familiar with. So yeah, thanks. Absolutely. 
Banging pots for the hero nurses. I'm not sure if that was also going on in other countries, but definitely, well, banging pots. Yeah, anyway, because yeah, in the in the UK, that was a huge one. So I just wrote down wearing masks, so solidarity for the National Health Service, which people have mentioned, lockdowns, um, vaccination and PCR tests um, were rituals and symbols, symbolic actions that we could take to show that we're in this together, which if, if you remember, that then relieves points one and two, which is um, the uh, feeling of isolation and um, what was number two again? <laughs> oh, I'm going to go back and even check. Here we go. Um, feeling meaningless. Yeah. All right. So let's go forward again. Okay. So the result, the result of using mass formation is so, first of all, our friends at the WHO. At the World Health Organization, I, um, but, but to give them a bit of credit, this was back in 1948, um, they defined what health is. So health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And that's really important because normally when we think of health, we think of, um, you know, am I physically well or not? But actually, a more modern term that we use nowadays is wellness. So it's the idea that it's not only about our physical health, but it's also our mental health, our spiritual health is included in wellness, and also our social well being. So it's generally being a healthy, happy person with a healthy, happy mental state, physical body, and also um, inner, inner, inner connection, connection to our true connection to ourselves, connection to who we truly are, the spiritual side, connecting to who we really are inside ourselves all right so mass formation gives the masses then give their health to the authorities because and this is a, a key phrase from dr mateus desmet uh, emotionally and cognitively only a small part of reality becomes important so we focus so much on this one external threat that the masses give their health to the authorities Okay, and also, um, if you are someone that is really taken in by the fear, then you are very willing to do things that ordinarily would not make any sense, that would be logically uh, nonsensical. And those things we can talk about in the in the history burning of the witches, we can also talk about um, the Jews in Nazi Germany. So these atrocities that people are willing to commit um when people and 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 that requires a deep level of anxiety and fear um and anger and frustration that is directed at an external threat so emotionally and cognitively only a small part of reality becomes our focus okay so what can we do about it so the first thing to notice uh, sorry the first thing to mention is that um Matthias Desmond, he argues that, and I believe this is a kind of an estimation. So you've got two extremes. You've got 30% on the right, and that's the people that are, we could use the word awake, or that can see the truth or can see the woods through the trees, or however you want to explain it. So he says about 30% of us can see what's really going on, and we're not willing to participate. Uh, and that 30% does not have to be immediately. I was talking the other day to a nurse. And realized that she'd been lied to and she was actually going through that process right now of realizing um, that, that she'd been lied to. So the 30% we're all at different stages, but we can we're starting or we can see the wood through the trees. And we don't just believe outright what we're told. The other extreme, the 30% on the other side, those are the people that are fully engaged. And they're the ones that we've probably all experienced that we maybe lost some friends or um, are absolutely not willing to listen to anything that you've got to say. And then the 40% in the middle are key because the 40% in the middle follow the crowd. And the 40% in the middle, they go wherever the majority of the people go and those 40 percent also again key 
want to be in a comfort zone. The last thing they want is to feel uncomfortable. So that 40% are following the, again, this is not my opinion, this is based on what uh, Dr. Matthias Desmond says. So, um, so that 40%, they, uh, they uh, generally follow the crowd and they also uh, want to remain comfortable. They don't want to be uncomfortable. And following the crowd keeps them feeling that way. So also I've deliberately put here that most of the sheep on the left are looking to the left. Uh, most of the sheep in the middle are looking to the right. And then the, the sheep on the right guys, the 30% that can see the woods through the trees, um, we want that 40% to look in our direction. Um, I, if you've seen on uh, Netflix, there was a, a, a documentary about Cambridge Analytica. I've forgotten the name. If anybody knows the name, then please put that in the Q&A so that I can let everyone know. But that was about um, convincing the British public to vote for Brexit. And what Cambridge Analytica did was they focused on the middle people, those undecideds. And that, that was their target, was the people that are in the middle that, are, that, that, that can be swayed either way. Okay. So what can we do about it? I'm just going to give you what I feel is some kind of information from these different sources that we can use to discuss and decide together what can we do about mass formation. So the first one is from this, uh, this uh, podcast. So... This is what Dr. Matthias Desmet says. He says that highly educated and intelligent people are extremely susceptible to mass formation, which is very interesting because he says that it's very often the intelligent people that succumb to mass formation. And he also says that logical argument does not work. And this is where I just wanted to mention David Cheralambos because David, who's also on the Mind Health uh, committee and has done uh, connection room sessions uh, in the past, several. Um, he discusses different ways that we can communicate with those people um, instead of just trying to use logical argument because logical argument uh, doesn't work. If you present the facts, that's not going to work because we're talking about emotion. We're not talking of so critical thinking is actually not enough. And this is vital because a lot of people say that, you know, I'm just going to tell them the facts, you know, and it's just, it's not according to Dr. Matthias Desmond going to work. All right. The ultimate cause of the problems we're facing now is not a malevolent evil. Again, very interesting argument. That's not the problem, the malevolent evil. It's, it's a way of thinking which created both the elite and the psychological state of the population. So what he's saying is, and I'd like us all to just think about this as we discuss afterwards possible solutions. But what he's saying is, it's a way of thinking which, which it's our way of thinking which has actually created this elite and the psychological state. All right, that's what he says. So now I'd like to just quickly mention this Dr. Robert Lanza and what does he say in this study from quantum mechanics and quantum physics. And this for me is fascinating. So he says that the observers, the observers is us, the people, the observers of reality ultimately define the structure of re physical reality itself. The world is not something that is formed outside of us, simply existing on its own. You, me, and anyone else live in a quantum gravitational universe and come up with a globally agreed upon cognitive model of reality by exchanging information. So what he's saying there, is that we, the people, through our collective um, agreed upon cognitive model, are literally, in case in the case of quantum mechanics, creating the external reality, and that links in with what I was just reading from Dr. Matthias Desmet that the cause of the problem is the way of thinking that creates the problem. Okay, and then finally we've got Charles Eisenstein. What did he say in the General Assembly? So he said that the, total, the totalitarian scheme is a mirror. Ultimately, it comes down to getting our sense of self-worth, identity and acceptance from another source. Courage is a group function. When I see others being brave, it helps me to be brave too. And we have to offer a different possibility. 
So using that information there. We have an interesting comment that came in from Carmel. She said she felt insulted by Matthias. How are intelligent people not listening to the facts? Well, this is, this is exactly what we're talking about, mass formation psychosis. Would you like to address that, Robito? Because that is very frustrating. And when you wake up to issues and you're aware of it, it just seems so obvious to you and you can't go back to sleep. So uh, we all totally understand your frustration. We all experience it, but we've come to understand uh, that we're dealing with something in a very pervasive um, hypnotic way that uh, we, we haven't been aware of before. So go with it, Rubito. We have to remember that we all at one point, all of us at one point believed the mainstream narrative. We all did. I remember the moment when I realized, how can you have permanent growth on a finite planet? It's so obvious that especially permanent growth that destroys the planet, how, how, because I've recently discovered a different, uh, a different theory, which is what about permanent growth, which regenerates the planet. But anyway, the way that we're doing it right now, a permanent growth on a finite planet, of course, that doesn't work. It doesn't make any sense because we'll end up cutting all the trees down. It's obvious, but I didn't know that at one point. Um, I remember um, when I was watching adverts and, um, and, I, and I remember one time commercials on TV and I asked my mum once, like, is that true? And she said, oh, they're not allowed to lie to us. There's there's an there's a they have these uh, independent organizations in place to make sure that they don't lie to us in the in the commercials so i was like okay so then they must be telling me the truth um the same with well, there's so many examples we we all at one point had that awakening moment that realization moment where we realized that they're that that, that we're not being told the truth and then we started to explore that. We probably, many of us then went down, that, down the rabbit hole, discovered how dark it goes, how connected everything is, uh, felt that, that feeling of total doom and gloom, that feeling of there's nothing we can do, this is hopeless, how can we possibly take that on? Um, and then after that, we start to go through a process of desperately trying to wake everybody up. Listen to us, like, how can this be? Don't you know that this is going on? And I feel that then we start to go into a process. How about we start focusing instead on creating something else? So the point is we all go through this process and we have to remember that everybody else is going through this process. And, not, and uh, one other quick thing I'll say is if you've watched that UK CV family documentary, then you'll see those people talking. They were not people that were ignorant, stupid, didn't care. Um, these were um, intel are intelligent, kind human beings. Like uh, if you spend time traveling, uh, as I have traveled a lot around the world, you'll see the vast majority of people are kind, loving human beings. And um, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's, uh, it's what well, it's to do this cognitive dissonance, dissonance, isn't it? It's that realization that our entire worldview was wrong. Are we going to accept that our entire worldview was wrong and we're going to have to step out of the crowd and start to go through that process of, of, of dealing with the fact that everything that we thought was true was not true and the extent that we're being harmed by the systems in place today. So we have to have compassion, we have to have empathy, and we have to understand that everybody is in their own process at their own speed and things will happen for them at the right time for them. That's what so I would true. say to that. And, and you know, we're all, and, and our dialogue along the lines that Rubito and I'll carry it on, it's not them against us. These are all people that uh, are, everybody's going to, wake up in their own time some may not um when you are talking i think some of you are talking here i'm reading your q and a's uh about when somebody finally wakes up and why didn't they listen to you and one says well i i've been labeled a conspiracy theorist these are all labels that have been put on people that have woken up uh to discredit them and they've they've crowded them with a, you know as if it's disinformation as they call it um and we realize it's it's become the flip side of that 
But uh, and and there's no question as we go on, we hear more and more stories that sound outrageous. And you know what? You park it, and you know that anything is possible in this world right now. So that you are open to uh, what's coming our way and what kind of changes we may be going through. But you know, injecting humor is absolutely a uh, very positive way to engage someone. Um, and I think I talked last week too about how someone told me their loved one has like got fourth stage cancer and had huge uh, coronary issues and the emotional, then I went, you go straight into your heart. So it doesn't become an, an intellectual uh, kind of, well, how do I engage them? You go straight to your heart and you go, Oh my God. And then how you talk totally opens up the floodgates for them to talk. And David, I want you to talk to how humor and how to engage and how the questioning, because this kind of gets into how we engage people. And I think it's... Yeah, maybe if I just make one comment. So on the Reaching People project, um, which you can look at reachingpeople.net, we look into the mechanism by which people are thinking the way they do and acting the way they do. And just to answer one of the things why facts do not work is because when we're talking from the rational mind, we're accessing our unconscious mind. That's where our facts are stored. So if you're talking to someone that has different facts in their unconscious mind, the fact you're sharing isn't a fact to them. So that's why it creates cognitive dissonance. And this is why the highly intelligent people will fall for it a lot because the mind is easily programmable. So it's really the, the latest behavioral science technology has the ability to to convince people of things without their knowledge or consent. That's how mm. subtle it is now. So yeah, so that's why you're going to see these conversations. So yeah, we, we go into this a lot, but um, yeah, back to you, Roberto. Let me ask well, just a basic question. I, and this just a little bit, because I know people are thinking this too. What makes some people more easy, easily programmable than others? Uh, I'm just going to tell you what Dr. Matthias Desmond says, because he actually was asked that question in his uh, Corbett Report podcast. And he said that this has been discussed over and over and nobody really knows. So Kim, David, what's the answer? Because he doesn't know. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and again, I, again, bringing spirituality in here a little bit humans, if we, if we look out at the bigger, bigger picture of, of why we're here on this planet, we're, we're on a journey of human evolution and evolution of consciousness. And so coming back to Jennifer's question of, you know, what I can't remember exactly what you said, Jennifer, why is it some people see it and what, why is it others don't? To me, why are some just, people more easy to, uh, to, to influence and others aren't? Why are some people more easy to, um, to take them into the total? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you, because you it comes question. back to one's level of awareness which is a very difficult thing to sometimes to put into words, but it's it, awareness is awareness. And, and uh, uh, we, we have what is called a, a ring pass knot uh, around us, around our consciousness that contains the amount of reality that we can uh, manage at any one time. And everybody's um, limitations and, and content of that reality is different from everybody else's. And as our consciousness expands, the ring pass knot circumference expands and we understand more about life. And nobody can force that change on anybody else because our, our journey of evolution of consciousness is very unique to each person. We're all on the path. We're all going in the same direction, but we're all at a different place along that continuum. And so we will, we will just see things when we're ready and there's nothing, I, that's how it is. That's beautiful. And, you know, we are more than our physical selves, right? Is uh, the awareness. And that's beautifully explained, Kim. Rubito, all over to you. I just wanted to say, please, everybody remember what Kim just said and also what Jennifer just said, that we're more than our physical selves, because that will also come into um, the, uh, the solutions also from suggested from the people that we're looking at today. But what I would say here is that what that's telling us is that us trying to persuade the people on the left, so we're the, we're the ones on the right, of what we feel, what we think isn't going to work. We need to um, uh, 
we need to present a different way of thinking, a different way of being that is attractive to that middle group, that 40%, because that middle group, that 40%, um, are going to be inspired by us if we are uh, presenting a different way of thinking and a different way of being. And they're going to be attracted to uh, different, uh, uh, different um, systems. And um, uh, for example, going to the World Council for Health, they're going to be attracted to going to the World Council for Health if it's presented as a positive and it's presented as something not threatening to them. So what Dr. Matthias Desmond says is we have to continue to speak out. He says that dissonant voices cannot wake up the masses, but they constantly disturb the mass formation. And by constantly disturbing the mass formation, you stop people from getting to that point where they can actually do harm on the other people. For example, burning the witches, for example, the Jews in Nazi Germany, you stop that because that 40% is not 100% convinced by that 30% on the other side. So you're not trying to convince the other, according to Dr. Matthias Desmer, trying to convince the other is not going to work. I just uh, claim my right to express my opinion in a sincere way. And the mass eventually exhausts itself and mass formation always destroys itself in the end. We start to become have to move this thing we have to become in touch with the external principles of life around us nature around us these are all quotations by the way but i just didn't put quotation marks for everything so these principles of life and nature are the real guiding forces for society that it for a society that is, is humane and a life worth living and we have to reconnect to these principles which i would argue is what um uh, what kim was talking about is the spiritual practice, the going within ourselves, doing the inner work. So Dr. Robert Lanza, what does he say? His is a bit shorter. He says, to change physical reality into a more positive place, we need a profound shift in our ordinary everyday worldview as a network of observers. So in other words, we as a collective, we're asking everybody to participate in co-creating something else, because if we can create a network that is focused on this, According to quantum mechanics and quantum physics and Dr. Robert Lanza, this will become the new reality. And I like that because that's a scientific explanation for these spiritual ideas of manifesting your uh, reality, the law of attraction and what you focus on expands. OK, so now we've got uh, Charles Eisenstein and his solution from the, what he said in the General Assembly. So he said. We're ready to become mature. We're ready to look within. We're ready to look to each other. That is where the healing begins. Sometimes we have to fight the old when it tries to destroy the beautiful model we're making. But fundamentally, change happens because you present something so beautiful and so inviting to people that they say yes. And I would argue that by you being that beautiful, inviting type of person, you can do it on an individual level, not only on a collective level. And maybe uh, this is something for us to, to dwell on. Maybe this is what it takes for the health authority, authorities that were broadly respected to betray us, for us to then look within ourselves. And he does actually then say after that to look within ourselves. But I deleted the sentence and then I didn't want to go back to the podcast to find that sentence because it took me forever to get these all right, so I would argue be the example means that we need to start this process of moving away from the external threat and moving into what we want to manifest and what we want to create. And I love this picture and I'm really happy that I finally managed to be able to use it for something. I've had this picture on my computer for years and there's a guy, a politician, and everybody's demonstrating. And if they just walked away, the politician would fall into the chasm. This is from uh, Bob Moran. He's a cartoonist and he shares all his images for free. Walk this way. Love this picture. And uh, it was actually Charles Eisenstein that referred to this quotation, which has been, he said, you know, it's a bit cliche, it's been overused, but nevertheless, it rings true. 
it's 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 relevant and it's true and he actually um stated this in the general assembly meeting you never change things by fighting the existing reality to change something build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete and I wanted to finish with this uh, video from uh, Shabnam Palesa Mohammed, who is in the steering committee of World Council for Health, um, where she actually said to the Making Sense team at the Better Way conference, she said, the last two years have pushed us to realize our power and the fact that we've got to build the better way and how much energy do we give to fighting the other side as opposed to creating the better way. Currently, I'd say it's probably about 50-50, but as we keep moving down this path, we're going to stop thinking about them. We're going to be thinking only about us. We have ideas. All the answers we need are within us. We are the ones we've been waiting for. And obviously, with COVID positive news and my mindset, I'm fully focused on where we want to go. And so this is for me, my input at the end. Not uh, anyway. So this means coming together as a community, talking about our concerns, dealing with our pain, offering our skills, directing our energy to what we want our new normal to be like and making this happen. And also we are all the heroes, which is what Jennifer said earlier on in this presentation, and we all have skills to offer. Dr. Tess Lowry said at the end of the Better Way conference that we're all messengers. Uh, and she was saying she loves pigeons and that we're, we all need to go off and spread the message and we absolutely do need to go off and spread the message but i would say we're not only messengers we're also new reality creators all of us so we need to do the work within ourselves we need to heal our wounds we need to find out what skills and talents we've got to offer and it doesn't have to be on the big stage you know it could just be with your family it could be with your friends but finding our own truth going through um, this uh, going through this process of inner work. I just wanted to say that at COVID Positive News, we have our mentor meetups where we have different people that have come to us with skills and talents, and we do live sessions there um, every week where you can do just that. And that's the end. Thank you, everyone. And that was just uh, so inspiring. Thank you so much, Rubito, and, and uh, our great panel here. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, David and everybody else that's joined us. Um, now, are all of you looking at the Q&As? Do you want to go through some of that? Um, yeah, maybe at this I'd point, add something. I can say yes, maybe at this ahead, point, Kim and David, David would like to. Yeah. <clears throat> I think, you know, we talk about, I mean, I love that quote from Buckminster Fuller. Um, you know, we, we have to create something different and new. But the problem is, if we're creating it from the same consciousness that created the previous thing, we just keep recreating the same problems, just in a different guise, just like Groundhog Day movie. And this is why I, you know, we, we all have our own um, lens through which we see reality and our own learnings, um, you know, and, and, and how we tend to explain things. And, you know, from what I've been learning from self-realized teachers, which means that they're in a completely different state of consciousness from the average human, is that the biggest thing that we have to work on is our ignorance, our, our, our unawareness and our misunderstanding of what reality and what life is really about. And this is the deep, deep, as far as I've experienced so far anyway, the deepest work that we can do on ourselves. It, it goes beyond personal growth. Personal growth is yeah, working on ourselves, changing us on our, uh, ourselves, but spiritual uh, transformation, uh, I, I don't really like to use that word spiritual, but it, it's working at the deepest level of consciousness that we can reach, where we are transforming <clears throat> what in the system that I follow is called unconscious patterns. So we have these unconscious patterns, which run our thoughts, our beliefs, our mind, which then translates into our actions and our behaviors. And, uh, you know, patterns such as greed or competitiveness or selfishness. And the problem with these patterns is that they're very, very unconscious and very, very sneaky. And even though we think we've got a grip on them and we're, you know, making headway, they just keep tripping us up over and over again. And this is the biggest challenge because collectively everybody is operating through the lens of their patterns and and this is the this is big work it's it's not an overnight job well and i would the, say so. 
Can I just uh, sorry, David. can I just tell you what I did? I, and it's I opened up Maria Munton, who has moved from Australia uh, to England. And Maria, I think a lot of us are following. All of us are following what's going on in Australia. I'm actually Australian too, and I live in Canada. But I've been living here since I was young. But uh, it's devastating what's going on in Australia. And certainly Kim is in New Zealand and it's devastating what's going on there too. And I think once you're at the point that you're actually engaging in a talk like we're having today and contributing, I think we all know that we've chosen to be here. We're working together and going to collaborate together to get through this. And, and certainly um, everything that you say, Kim, uh, on the spiritual note, it resonates with all of us. And the enlightenment that we're all having if that's engaging and exponentially for all of us is quite phenomenal and thank you so yeah because what i'm uh, extremely passionate and interested in at the moment and i'm going to be focusing on this going forward with cpn as well is parallel systems and there there, there are a lot of uh, things going on out there that are so there's one that i've just become aware of where it's about everything within that community should have more positive impact on the planet than uh, not not only that it should be sustainable everything that there's even the building the houses the, everything should have a tenfold positive impact on the planet so everything should be net positive and i feel that we can aspire to those things, to those parallel systems uh, as, as we're moving forward while at the same time doing the inner work uh, because uh, we also need community as well. So how, how better to, 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 to become part of a conscious community and doing both at the same time? Sorry, David, do you wanna? Yeah, the, um, the point that Kim was making about the unconscious patterns is very key because uh, that's effectively what's driving a lot of people's behavior. So the, it's really a lot of it as well as the story they tell themselves. But one of the patterns that's really key that we discussed last week is this supplicative pattern, which effectively is the unconscious assumption that the government has all the power and you just have to do as you're told. So this is a pattern deep that a child will have with its parent for the first six years until it advances and starts to realize its own power. But when it comes to authority, a lot of people that doesn't mature for. And this, and of course, the thing with unconscious patterns, you won't be able to consciously rationalize them, but you can see them. And when I was working with Bruce Lipton on a project, he would say to me, you know, just look around and you'll see your belief systems. So these will come up in situations. So if you look at Milgram's study, Milgram's study, if you would have asked people before that study, would you electrocute someone just someone told you to do so? I'm sure that, that none of them would have said yes. That makes sense. But the unconscious pattern is when they were placed in the situation, they pressed the button. And in the UK, the social experimenter guy, Danny, he showed this. He walked into a park in Hyde Park and he had a yellow vest on and a tannoy and he's just started ordering people around and they just started following him. Where if you'd have said to them, would you take orders of a random guy? Well, of course not. So it's really key. What Kim said, the, the unconscious nature of it is really, really key because there's such a, 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 a vortex, a difference between what people think they would do and what they actually would do. That also links in with the, um, this whole idea of being the example is... Um, not only the Milgram experiment, but there's been many other experiments that were following that same procedure. And that when the people see uh, somebody not conforming and not actually doing it first, the percentage of people that will then go forward and do it reduces. Yeah, so that's a, a, one, a wonderful example of yeah. how our behavior and our example has an effect yeah i also i'm of the opinion that we can sh radically shift people's awareness because it's already been done i mean when you look at what guy Debord did in the 60s with situationalists what you look how the uh, the civil rights movements etc cetera, etc cetera, it's a natural occurrence that happens all the time but you see what they've managed to do over the last two years is change people's behavior radically 
that shows it can be done. You just need to understand that it's the key is that it's not done consciously. It's not done talking to the rational mind. It's done talking to the unconscious mind, which is why facts will have almost no effect, almost no effect, unless the fact is delivered via a story or a metaphor, because stories and metaphors are massive delivery mechanisms for information. That's what they are. Um, and of course, once you try to, if you try to tell someone something where their unconscious mind doesn't believe it to be true, regardless of whether it's true or not, it will be rejected. That makes sense. So I think it's, it's when you understand that it's an obstacle course, and if you manage to navigate that, then you can make people aware of something. And it only takes so much information to go into their system for their whole perception to change. Yeah, I just want to say that that's emotions, right? Because um, stories and metaphors have an emotional impact. And when we are talking to people and trying to meet them, uh, it's about empathy. It's about feeling the emotion. If I mention this topic, are they, are they starting to get more annoyed? Are they, are they, are they still interested? Is there a bit of resistance coming and navigating those emotions as well on and navigating, feeling, empathizing with the person yeah. that you're communicating? Massively. With. We've also got a massive illusion that we think that we're very logical, right? Just if someone eats McDonald's, tell them that it's not good for them and see if they stop. Okay. <laughs> it's the, when we look at our lives, the things that we do that are not good for us, it's not do, due to a lack of logic. Yeah, we already know, <laughs> you know, people that smoke, they're under no illusion that it's good for them. Okay, so this thing about logic, we really, it's, uh, there's a really, really good TED talk by Lee Ross, and it's called the Objev Objectivity Illusion. Uh, and it's really eye-opening how our perception, what we, our perception of our perception is is not an accurate perception. <laughs> it's a way and also um, uh, there's emotional reasoning and motivated reasoning. So, uh, I, for example, somebody, so there's, there's an article, uh, there was a recent article about in the Daily Mail. And then so somebody could react emotionally with that and say, it's too late now. They've not, uh, they, they've not stood up and said something before. But the thing is, we don't actually know if they've always known. We don't know, especially because mass formation hits everybody in every aspect in every part of society. So we need to uh, be aware of our own emotions when we're reacting to what's happening externally. Just like, as I was kind of also pointing out that we can focus only on, and then we can forget to just take care of ourselves and just take some time out, take our time off screens, go for a walk in nature. Well, this is very key, it's particularly in when we're having conversations. And one of the things that really prevents us from having a good open conversation with someone on the other side, and it's because we use the term the other side. That's the first problem, because then we've created a, a distinction. And then when we create the distinction, we create two group identities, we had we identify and then we're on opposite sides of the table and that never ends well. So the first thing we have to do is change our perspective that we're on their side, they're on our side, we're part of humanity. The whole energy will change. That makes sense. And that's really the first part. And until that happens, all conversations will be, and David Bone wrote a beautiful book on this called On Dialogue, is that until you get into a circle, until you're on the same side where there's no sides, you will be get playing a game of table tennis where making points will be to score a point. And you'll never convince anyone that way because they will never surrender a point. I mean, that's so it's really I key. think it was, uh, I believe, yeah, it was Dr. Uh, Dr. Matthias Desmond that was also talking about how we have to forget about them and us. Um, they're the bad guys, we're the good guys. Uh, and it was uh, Charles Eisenstein who said, because I couldn't put all these amazing quotes into this presentation, but Charles Eisenstein was saying in the General Assembly that, um, that, uh, that oh gosh, what did he say? He was saying, it'll come back to me. Sorry, Kim, you joined to go. <laughs> I can't remember right now. I can't remember what I was going to say now. There's something, to, yeah, sorry, that's gone. Oof. <laughs> 
Okay. You know, no, but I'm just um, looking at uh, comments made and Jennifer Depew has made a comment and you're right, stress creates nutrient deficiencies. And this is why there's a big focus on having your nutrients and healthy living, healthy eating, uh, because that feeds into a, an imbalance emotionally, physically, tires you out, makes you more prone to all of the angles that they, that are being used and, and anything negative that comes to you from anybody, including the media. So it's, it's extremely important. I would really just quickly like to say, because you just mentioned the negative and not being in the negative, is with, with COVID positive news, the reason that this all started is the science of focusing, of, of nurturing a positive mindset, of, of develop, of, uh, you've got a story and noticing your, 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 um, your, your instant reaction. Is it a negative reaction or a positive reaction? Because the more that we can nurture that positive mindset, the, stu the studies and the science shows that it increases longevity, it increases our health, improves our health, that we have a better thought action repertoire, that we're more able to meet opposing views. The science now in, um, um, in uh, psychology about the, the benefits of nurturing a positive uh, mindset, it's, uh, it's, you know, it can't be denied, it's, it's there. And so um, uh, people have, have, have healed from placebo effect. You know, if you believe that you're gonna heal, you can physically heal. So, um, so this is so important, this, uh, this, this positivity. What Charles Eisenstein okay. said, sorry, Jennifer, what Charles Eisenstein okay. said was, um, we're all wrong about something. Every one of us is wrong about something. So for us to assume what David was saying, for us to assume that we've got it right and they've got it wrong is um, um, a bit naive since we're, we're, all, we're, you know, we're all wrong about something and we'll find out that we're wrong at some point in the future. And, and Roberto's not referring to the fact that uh, the extreme opinions, he's talking about just the everyday things that we keep learning. And um, we have to be cautious not to be opinionated uh, about our position versus their position. As David pointed out, we're all together and we're all trying to work together on all of this. So thanks very much. I had some it's other nice. ideas. As yeah, it's like science, if you do a scientific experiment, the whole idea is that your opinion might change or should be, right? I mean, if science is done properly, it's a hypothesis and what you're trying to do is prove yourself wrong. So science itself is all about, um, we don't know the answer. It's about, um, you know what I mean? It's, it's kind of where the, 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 the facts change as we learn more. And I think that's what Charles Eisenstein was referring to, is that our, our information can adapt and change as we learn more. And we shouldn't assume that what we know right now is the ultimate truth. That's right. And also, and the power of the mind, mind over matter, we can create the change that we want. So having discussions like we're having today and bringing people together and, and please tell us how you like this webinar um, approach because we really want it to be as inclusive as possible without you know, negative interruption. But um, we want to bring good dialogue together so that we can create a, you know, a positive way forward. And we will be talking in future discussion groups about optimism, pessimism, you know, the effect of this, and Robito touched on that. And I would like to let you know that our next uh, connection room, the topic we've chosen is the power of our own story to create a better future. Let's co-create. And if any of you want to comment a little bit about that, uh, and then I think we're almost ready to, um, we don't want to leave because this dialogue could go on and on. It's wonderful. But at some point, we're going to have to, um, to close the session and look forward to the next one that we'll have. I'm sorry, I have to go anyway, because um, this poor guy, I'm using all his data. I'll just share one last last thing. Um, one of the overriding principles that I've learned in, in, in the system that I've been learning is Zidu Du Ren, which means lift yourself up, lift up others. So we do the work on ourselves and then that enables us to help others. And we don't have to wait till we're perfect because that's impossible. Uh, we're all on the same journey, all uh, you know, at a little different place. Um, 
you know, some behind, some in front of us, and we're just all leading our, our each other in, in, in a better direction. There's a fantastic book by Bruce Lipton, David, you've met him, A Spontaneous Evolution, I believe it's one of my, that's my favourite one. I know it's got some others that are more famous, but that one's my favourite, Spontaneous, that we're all collectively on, a, on a, a conscious evolution. We're all evolving together. Roberto, can you write that in the chat uh, for people? Because you're absolutely right. And, you know, to, to, to kind of raise it to a spiritual level, because we'll probably close there on a very positive note. We're all connected and every one of us that are together here talking play a vital role in creating and co-creating the new reality that we want together because we are all one together. And once we realize that, that includes everybody, whatever, whatever level that they're involved, they're all, we're all working together and we will try to raise everybody's consciousness and that's what we're all here to do. Thank you for all the nice comments Rodrigo. coming through now as well. The comments coming in the chat saying they've enjoyed it and everything. Thank you all so much. Oh, this is just so wonderful. Thanks, everybody. This is really beautiful to see. We really all appreciate right. it. Rabito, uh, that was such a wonderful presentation and talk. I just loved it. Now, people asked about uh, getting a copy of the slides. So I think uh, we may have that on our, put that into our um website at the World Council for Health and have that available in Mind Health area on the website. So absolutely, I can share, I can share them with you. If it's okay, I'll, I'll send them uh, maybe tomorrow because it's it's 1030 right now. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, I've... don't worry about it right now, because they really they're going to when they put this out too, uh, they'll they can link it to uh, the, to have the slides in the description. Yeah. Thank you so okay. much. Thanks, everybody.